Patrick Rowan Blackburn, professor at the Department of Philosophy and Science Studies at the Roskilde University. He will take you through the theory of language, through complex mathematical structures, through the micro-mechanical systems that give corpus to the language and explain its workings. Ultimately, he will explain exactly what I just meant. If there are things which cannot be spoken, or for which its meaning cannot be apprehended, they will be represented by the artist Hendrik Schultz. By the unfortunate cancellation of the performance of both hands, cocktails will never the mass be chilling at the bar, while the elf at the stale moment will be spinning some records. Welcome to this edition of Science and Cocktails. I would like to you to extend a warm welcome to Patrick Blackburn. Hello. Can everybody hear me? Good. Well, first of all, I'd like to uh, say thank you to the organizers for inviting me here tonight, and uh, a couple of words about myself. Um, as you see, my name is Patrick Blackburn. As you can hear, I'm not Danish. I'm actually from a Danish-sized country on the other side of the world called New Zealand, um, rather far away from here. Now, um, as you can see, I'm currently working at the philosophy department at Rook University. Um, before this, I was working at I was working in France uh, at a computer science department. Before that, I was working in Germany at a computational linguistics department. Before that, in Amsterdam and Utrecht at a mathematics and computer science department and a philosophy department. And you may be wondering, what is the thread that holds all these things together? There's two answers. One thread is language, and the other thread is logic. Since although I'm currently working as a, in a philosophy department at Utre uh, working at a philosophy department in Rook, uh, I would fundamentally describe myself as a logician. Now, what logic has to do with tonight's subject? Sorry. What logic has to do with tonight's subject may not be clear at this stage. Perhaps it will be clearer later. Okay? So let me just get on with tonight's talk. I very much like the idea of these science and cocktail meetings. And in fact, I came along to the meeting two weeks ago where the discussion was about life on other planets. And in one sense, we like to think about science, I think, as being about mysteries. And how can I put it? Some mysteries are just so big and so grand that they just reach out and grab you. You don't need to advertise them. You don't need to ask, why are we excited by these things? They just are. Like, is there life on planets? Just to give a very obvious example. Does the Higgs boson exist? Okay. Is it possible to create artificial intelligence? Okay, more practical questions. Now we've spent fantastic amounts of money on sequencing the human genome. In theory, we have got so much information about the way human beings are constructed, the code that underlies them. Can we use this for practical purposes? Okay. Can we sort of use it for medical purposes? Other big questions, can we reconcile quantum physics and general relativity? These are big mysteries. In a sense, when I say that ultimately this talk is about 
what is meaning? I think you might be entitled to say, well, yes, that's a mystery in some sense, but perhaps it's a general mystery or a boring mystery or a too philosophical mystery or a mystery that's just so soft that something like science can't possibly begin to get its hand on it. Okay? It's just going to go through our fingers like sand. There's nothing really we can say about it. Okay? And I could maybe try and strengthen the, the question in some ways. How do we communicate? How is meaning possible? Good questions, bad questions, vague questions. I don't know. What if we try and sharpen the question just a little bit? And instead of talking just about meanings at first, move on to the primary tool that we've got for talking about meanings. The tool that we use all the time, and that's the tool of language. What's linguistic meaning? How do languages work? Okay. How do we language to communicate meaning if indeed we do? They're slightly more specific questions, and perhaps they're questions we've got some hope of getting some, some sort of grip on. Okay. Now, there's a few basic there's a few basic facts about language. For a start, human beings appear to be the only species on the planet that uses language to communicate with other members of their species. Okay, if you read a little bit about animal communication, you know that, well, there are some signaling systems out there. One of the classic ones is the way that bees communicate with each other. It's actually rather neat. The bee can sort of perform a little dance. It's called the wriggle dance, actually, or the waggle dance sometimes. And it can actually sort of say how far and in what direction food is from the hive. Apparently, it can't signal the height, and it can't do a few other things, but it is pretty good at signaling that kind of information. And probably everyone here has heard about the whale song. To be honest, we're not really quite sure what whale song is, as far as I'm aware. Okay, it may be the male sort of trying to signal something to the female. It may just be something aesthetic. We don't really know. It's a bit of a mystery. It's certainly very beautiful. It's certainly very loud. It can go halfway around the world, from Denmark to New Zealand, without any difficulty. There are signaling systems, and there certainly are animals that, in some sense, seem to communicate. I mean, we've all heard about the affectionate dog, the dog that we love, the one who sort of communicates with us in some intuitive and real sense. And, of course, then there's our cousins, the primates, the bonobos, the chimpanzees, and so on. Now, these are very clearly intelligent animals. They're social animals. Some of them are tool-using animals. In some sense, they're very, very much like us, but they don't use language. Signals, communicative social animals. And then you get some very, very hard claims about this, like Steven Pinker. I'm trying to paraphr I've paraphrased him slightly. Language is as different from other animals' communication system as an elephant's trunk is from other kinds of nostrils. We've got something special, and it's really, really different, just the way that an elephant's trunk is different from everybody else's nose. Could be right. Steven Pinker is somebody who follows in the line of a famous linguist, the most famous linguist called Chomsky, and he thinks that actually we've got a very, very special language organ, something dedicated to language, and he thinks it's as different as the elephant's trunk. It looks something like that. But I chose that image for a very real reason. That's not actually an image of an elephant's trunk. If you can read this, is actually, which I very much doubt if anybody can, this is actually an image of a lava flow that was recently found on the surface of Mars. It looks like an elephant's trunk, but it ain't. Okay? Now, for most of us in our species, language in some sense indicates intelligence. Okay? And this is an idea that goes back right to the birth of artificial intelligence. I mean, here is the founder, well, one of the founders of computer science, Alan Turing, uh, definitely one of the most interesting scientists of the century. But also, one of the first things he did in 1950 was to write the first paper considering the possibility of artificial intelligence. He created the computer. He understood the computer. He understood what computers could do and couldn't do. And then he asked the question, can computers be intelligent? And his answer was kind of interesting. 
In a sense, he refused to answer the question. He said, it's the wrong question. Don't ask, can computers be intelligent? That's ah, too diffuse. Instead, imagine a game. And in those days, it must have seemed a weird game. But for everybody here in this audience, it's not a weird game now. It's a game we've all played. It's sitting down and chatting, like behind Skype or behind something like that. You're some kind of judge, and you're chatting with two players. One is a human. One is some kind of artificial intelligence, perhaps. Your job is to decide which one is the human. Throw any questions you like at them. Personal, impersonal, just ask them anything you like. They will reply exactly as you like. The language can go anywhere. The conversation can go anywhere. But that's the only channel you have to them. You're blocked off in every other way. You just have the medium of words, printed words. And his point was if regularly you really cannot distinguish a certain program, a certain artificial intelligence from, some, from the ordinary human being, you have no right to say that that thing is unintelligent. Language use is sufficient to note intelligence. Well, I don't know. This is something you can debate, and people have been debating it for as long and probably will continue to debate it until the issue is settled one way or another, if that is ever done. Okay? But it's a very, very interesting notion, and it shows how important language is to us. But let's carry on with a little bit with Turing as well, because I think Turing's got more to tell us about language. One of the little themes that's going to be coming up all the time is, OK, we think we understand language, but could a computer do that? And if so, how? OK? If we think about what Turing told us about what computation is, one of the beautiful things that he told us about computation is that it's so, so simple in principle. It's about the manipulation of symbols. It's about these entities that in some sense have these internal states. Memory, the ability to remember, to compare, to do things. A beautifully, beautifully, beautifully simple model of computation. Okay? Now, <laughs> as soon as you sort of get that model in your head, you're almost drawn to say, look, can such a system really use language? And in fact, what I would personally would think was a very useful thing is that if you take, how can I put it, the roughly naturalistic view of life that ultimately we are creatures of evolution, we're the product of evolution, divine intervention is not necessary to explain life on this planet and so on, then at some sense we're going to be forced to build into that account how we got our capacities and how we came to use language. And if you start tying ideas like evolution together with Turing's simple model of computation and the idea of DNA, you start trying to get something down there on paper and you look at it and you think, yes, 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 there has to be something we can say there. We have to be able to do it. Or at least... It looks plausible. How plausible is it really? Okay. We can come at it from the other end. I've just been going in a sense into the very scientific thing. Let's think from the evolutionary perspective. Let's think from a computational perspective. We can turn around and we can come to language from a very, very social perspective. So instead of starting at the bottom, so to speak, down with the atoms of language and the atoms of language use, start at the top. Start with us as social creatures. And if we do that, we're probably tempted to say things like the American linguist, uh, in particular, Benjamin Wharf, who looked at some things in language, and he said some very, very strong, and to be honest, I think ultimately unjustifiable things about language. For example, sometimes he said that language determines thought, and linguistic categories determine cognitive capacities. That's kind of strong. OK, sometimes it was a little bit more muted language, influences thought, and linguistic characters influence cognitive capacities, but, okay, it's not clear exactly how strong that is. He pointed to all sorts of examples which, to be honest, can be a little dubious. For example, he pointed to the Hopi Indians. Now, the Hopi Indians, but well, Indian languages can be very, very interesting. The Hopi Indians apparently have a system in which there is nothing that looks like the sort of tense system we use in the European languages in which we manipulate time 
the way we sort of make reference to time, the way we locate events in time. From this, he drew the rather radical conclusion that the Hopi Indians don't have a sense of time, which is a bit strong, okay? They're living on the same planet as us. It's hard to see exactly what they mean. And probably everybody has heard about the sort of thing that Eskimos see snow differently for us. After all, they've got this huge vocabulary of 99 words or 999 words. And again, this isn't really something that is true. It's, well, it's something that is false. Sorry. Okay. But in a sense, if you scratch us all a little, we're all Warfians. Okay? It really is hard to break into that circle of what is fundamental in language. In a sense, it's always going to be like this Escher picture. We're never, we never seem to be able to find the bedrock on which we can stand. We never find the foundation if indeed there is a foundation, okay? Chicken and egg, which came first, the chicken and the egg, the concept of the language, what's in our head, what the thought. Wow, the chicken and the egg is really, really easy compared to the way it seems that language influences our thought and vice versa, okay? So there's something more interesting going on, some kind of interplay going on between what we think and how we say it, but can we say something more interesting about it? Those, in a sense, are some of the issues that people think about when they think about language. And what I'd like to do now in the next few slides is, so to speak, I'm going to be a car salesman and I'm going to sell you a car. And it's a really great car. It's never going to break down on you. It's going to go forever. And this car is called language. And it's an amazing thing. The performance is amazing. And I'm just going to advertise this car to you and tell you what this mystery that's right under your face and has been under your face all this time really looks like. It's an incredible thing and it needs explanation. So here's the car I want you to do. For a start, did you know that you can use your language, you maybe prefer Danish, I prefer English, to describe your world? Now, that may seem kind of obvious. You know, the cat is on the mat. And look, the cat is on the mat. Cool, but think about that a little bit. I can show you that the cat is on the mat in other ways. I can show you a picture of a cat on the mat. And yes, that says that kind of message. But what if you want to describe the world by saying, hey, the cat is not on the mat. I guess you could maybe show me a picture and there's a picture of a mat. But what the hell happened to the cat then? When I'm using language, I'm making a relation between the cat and the mat and the, the notness, the not thereness. The other thing's just a picture of a mat. What if you wanted to sort of say something general? What if you wanted to tell me that all the cats were on the mats? What are you going to do? Show me lots of cat on the mat pictures? Keep on picking up another one. We can be general in language. We can paint pictures of things that aren't there. We can talk about other times. We can talk about other places. This is really amazing stuff. Another thing we can do is we can vary the world around us. We can play what if games. This is a very, very important use of language and it can be a very dangerous and a very, very sensitive use of language. Okay, if Einstein had never been born, modern physics would look very different now. I've got a feeling that's probably true. Okay? If Maradona hadn't been set and off, Argentina would have won the game. I'm not a football fan particularly, but I can imagine this is something that arouses immense passions, especially in Argentina. And what about this? What do you suppose would happen if we opened the door to immigration across Europe? Okay? Pour the petrol down, throw the match in. Okay? We can do that with language. We can actually not just vary the world with language, we can create entire new worlds. Once upon a time, there was a small elf. She lived in a cottage by the sea. Every morning, she greeted the sun with strange elf songs. And every evening, she consoled the moon for its many sorrows. Both the sun and the moon loved the elf. The sun always shone a little brighter over her dwelling. And the moon was always a little less sad when she spied her dwelling below. One morning, while she was finishing a particularly difficult spell, there came a knock at the door. I'm sorry, but that's all I've got time for <laughs> on that particular story. But, okay, it's a nice story. Please note that this world differs in some respects 
from the world around us. Okay, this may not be true. We're in Christialia, which I know is a very special place. Okay, so there probably are elves here. The moon and the sun probably are these personal creatures, and we do engage in these kind of conversations. I know that, I know. But if we went into central Copenhagen, it's not like that, right? Only here in Christiania. Okay, cool. Okay, so we'll, we'll call it like that. We can create new worlds. Hey, guess what? We can change the world as well. With language. We can change the world. It's not just we can describe it or we can vary it or we can sort of make something new. We can actually change it. With this ring, I the wed, you are now married. The world has changed. It is no longer the place it was before. The world has moved into a new state. You make a promise. Okay? You make a promise. Now the world is different, these sense of obligations. We made the societal change. What is going to happen? What may happen? What won't happen? We christen somebody, we give a name. That is their new identity. That is the new way people look at them, the way they refer to them. How is it? We can even make new countries. The Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Some of it looks philosophical. Some of it looks of its time. But something else is going on. A new country is being born, the United States of America. We do things with language. Okay. And we do other things. So here's what may well be a whale song. So here's a, from Macbeth. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. Tis a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Now, I'm not quite sure what that language is doing. It was written 400 years ago in a language that was very much like English, but is no longer quite the same. But it still reaches across time. It can still do something. I don't know what. Here I'm just going to call it a whale song for Homo sapiens. Okay? <laughs> Okay, now I'm hoping I've convinced you that's a great car ride. You know, I'm a, I'm a car salesman. I was trying to tell you a car. That's language. That's what it will do. Do you want to take it out for a ride? You do, don't you? You want to give me your money for language? You do. Fine, except, yeah, I hope I've given you the feeling that it's an interesting thing. But the trouble with language is that actually it's so wonderful in a sense. It's something that's so much part of us that we take it for granted. I tried to say at the start that I tried to say at the start that so much about science is about finding puzzles, about finding mysteries, trying to solve them. Where's the mystery here? Language just seems so damn easy. We just do it. And we think everybody's going to do it. Okay? We accept without a word of question that of course R2D2 and C3PO, they speak. Okay, so R2-D2 makes funny little whistling noises, but we, we find it you know, perfectly normal that you know, C-3PO speaks with this funny British accent and is a bit of a nerd and so on. We just sort of absorb it all. That's the way it goes with language. Where's the problem? The problem is, this is, if for no other reason, this is why sometimes it's useful to think about language, say, from a computational perspective. It's because it just shows how achingly, 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 achingly hard it is. The thing that we take so for granted is as big a mystery as anything you see out there in the galaxy or anything that you see when you zero in on the structure of the atom, okay? So maybe you all heard of this. In 2011, there was an IBM programmed computer which won Jeopardy against the two best known players, Brad Russell and Ken Jennings. I mean, one of them was the guy who'd won Jeopardy for something like, I don't know, 80 times in a row. And the other one was the guy who'd won the most money in, in Jeopardy just about ever. And the computer won it. Basically, in Jeopardy, you have to, you read a question, you have to press a button, you get a chance to answer the question. So in order for this computer to win, it had to be able to understand the sound coming in, it had to be able to make sense of the question. It had to react fast saying, yes, 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 yes. I know where I'm going with this. 
and then it had to come out with the correct answer. It won. It won a million dollars, by the way, and they split the prize among various, among various strategies, uh, among various charities. Okay. Now, what is um, what is interesting is when you look at what it actually took to do this. When I say it was a computer, it was actually a network of. Let me see if I can remember. I cannot possibly remember this. Uh, yes, it was about 90 servers. There were over 2,000 highly parallel processors there. Uh, it had a processing speed of about 500 gigabytes a second, which basically meant it could go through, roughly speaking, the contents of a million books a second. Okay. Um, massively parallel use of techniques drawn from natural language processing, information retrieval, and so on. It had access to dictionaries, the salary, literature. I mean, no doubt it could look up tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, etc. About 200 million pages in all. Okay, that's what it took to do it. It won, and yet it was extraordinarily fragile at the same time. It won, especially when the questions were long and there were lots of clues that you could just hit it with all this processing and it would come back with an uh, answer. Ask a shorter question in which there was less context, less clue, less for all this power to bite on, it tended not to do it. Now here's the question. What did the success of this program tell us about language? Now I'm going to be a bit sort of mule-headed here. I'm going to say, it didn't really tell us very much, apart from the fact that they have some really good hardware, some really, really good programmers at IBM. Okay? Basically, it just confirmed what we already knew. If you know about anything about language, language use is hard. Okay? But we knew that already. To give a little point of comparison, an earlier IBM program managed to beat the world chess player, Kasparov, by following a strategy of intense, intense search through all the possibilities, just by out-calculation. I don't really think that taught us much about chess, and stubborn as I may be, I don't think that this narrow and fragile triumph in Jeopardy tells us much about language use. Because the point is, that program doesn't understand language. You're never going to be able to have a conversation with it. It's capable of pulling in a few random clues, making a good guess, well, a very good guess, coming back with the information, answering the question, but that's it. It's almost a monument, in a sense. The complexity of this program and the narrowness of its triumph, in the sense of it can just answer these kind of quiz show style questions, are practically a testimony to how wonderful and how unique our linguistic abilities are. At least that's my take. Okay. What is it that makes language so hard for machines and for other things? Why, why is it? There's actually two things I would say, or at least two things I'm going to focus on. Okay? The one thing is that the language that we use all the time is massively, massively, massively ambiguous. Okay? Now, ambiguity can be a good and wonderful thing. Okay, it is a good and a wonderful thing. Like one, probably one of the most famous books of literary criticism of the last century is William Empson's Seven Types of Ambiguity. It's this wonderful, it's this wonderful exploration about the way ambiguity is systematically used in poetry to create meaning. Ambiguity, the fact that we can interpret in different ways, is really what opens up the way, at least I think so, to the richness of literature. But so to speak. That's the ambiguity that we're aware of. That's the ambiguity we play with. Until you've actually gone down and looked at language in the face and really stared into how it works, you don't really realize just how ambiguous language is. And it's ambiguous at every, every, every level. OK, maybe the most obvious one is words can be ambiguous. Like, here is this simple English word, Bank. What's a bank? Well, it could be a river bank, okay? It could be the thing that you sit on in a park, a park bank or bench. It could, of course, be, you know, where you go and put your hard-earned money and all that sort of thing. Not the most difficult kind of ambiguity, but an ambiguity. And very, very often, context, additional information is going to 
resolve it for us. For example, if we're talking about robberies, well, we're pretty much going to zero in on this one. I mean, probably, well, I don't think there's sort of much of a market for sort of stealing park benches and getting away from them. And as for stealing that, well, it's a cute little bear, but apart from that, nobody wants to, nobody wants to do that. But this is only one level of language, okay? Even at speech, what about this? That's a nice peach. What did I say then? What, what, what did I say? Is anybody quite sure what I said? And how about if you're sort of throwing that as a voice recognition system of a computer? Am I talking about the fruit? Am I talking about what Martin Luther King said? Okay, they're both nice. But they're very, very different. Okay? What about this? The boy saw the girl with the telescope. What does that mean? At least two meanings there. Okay. Nice little girl with a telescope. Boy is seeing her. Okay. Oh, maybe a not so nice boy <laughs> staring at girls with a telescope. And these are merely two of the things, two of the levels at which ambiguity can strike. Now, sometimes, how do I put it? Let me come back. Mostly, this kind of ambiguity is invisible to us, and therein lies its mystery. Sometimes, we become aware of ambiguity, since it seems occasionally our brain runs into a solid concrete wall, and we see that something's wrong, and we can't get round to the other possibilities. Now, I'm not sure how many people will get this one. The horse race past the barn fell. That's a good sentence of English. Just about everybody, when they first hear it, they, they're sort of waiting for the sentence to finish. They say, it's not a good sentence of English. And I'm talking here about English speakers. Most English speakers, if you say, the horse race past the barn, barn fell, is that a sentence of English? They'll say, no way, it's not. But it is. Does anybody see it? What you said, and what's on the screen are two different things. Because you put the, the horse race past the I'm sorry. The, the horse, down. you're right. The horse race past the barn fell. Is that a sentence of English? It is actually, because let me tell you a little story. You own three horses, right? And there's one that you race down in the meadow. And there's one that you race down by the cornfield. And there's one where you race past the barn. Everything's going really cool by the one down in the meadow. You know, the horse race down by the meadow is happy. Okay? Everything's going cool with the one down by the cornfield. But oh, alas, the horse race past the barn fell. Yeah, I know, the horse race past the barn, that's the subject, and fell is this intransitive verb at the end, but we don't see that. This is called a garden path effect. It used to be considered that this taught us sort of something very, very deep about the way the mind works when it's processing structure. It doesn't seem to be so true, it seems to be something less interesting than that. Sometimes we don't get the other possibilities and we do trip over, but the real miracle of this language is that when you look at the ambiguities that are out there. It's really astounding. There's this invisible man out there. And if you've got a computational system that really should be able to detect all the possibilities, ambiguity kills it stone dead. Because there are so many possibilities at so many levels that the poor little computer just can't get going. Okay? It can't decide what's on offer. Okay? In a sense, something that is programmed in a traditional way to try and make a responsible considering by weighing all the options, just as too many options to consider and can't do the job properly. It's better to have something done, okay? So that's one of the problems. The second problem that you face is kind of almost like a corollary with this. Hey, why don't we notice all this ambiguity? How do we use language so effectively? It's because we've got knowledge. We're always in a context. We're always interpreting relative to a context. We're somewhere. We're bringing this knowledge to bear. Simple. All we need to do is create, say, computer systems with enough knowledge. Well, that's nice. That's a very, very nice idea. And all of a sudden, we're looking like something like that question answering system, which has all the knowledge. But how do you bring the right knowledge to bear at the right time? How do, you make a an, how do you make a computer interpret the way that we interpret? Sure, there is a machine that seems to be wonderful, wonderful, wonderful at interpreting language and handling all this ambiguity. And they sort of, these machines sort of live up here 
and nobody knows how it's programmed, and we know a little bit about how it's made, but we understand very, very little about the way it actually processes language. Okay? To put it another way, in a sense, we're back in another labyrinth. We're back into that place where we can't find the foundation again. Where's the base? Where's the top? I mean, Turing said something kind of nice, language indicates intelligence. And that's true, but it's beginning to look like he's right in a sense that he didn't intend, namely, really, the only thing we've got that's capable of orchestrating all the information we need to cope with, lan with language is the thing that's sitting on our shoulders. <sighs> what are we going to do? Well, the response to the computer scientists and the computational linguists and the technologists has basically been, hey, let's just make some interesting stuff that's kind of useful, you know, like Google Translate and all that sort of thing. And this is certainly a good option, and these tools are useful, and sometimes they get some stuff right, and sometimes they get some stuff wrong, and sometimes they tell us some stuff. Sometimes you think that's really, really good. You know, when I'm out at Rook, because to my shame, I still haven't learned Danish, I use Google Translate to, to sort of understand what my colleagues who are sitting over there are saying. Sometimes under Google Translate, these guys say some pretty weird stuff, by the way. <laughs> But I, I think they're okay, really. I think it might be Google Translate, but I'm not sure. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to move along, and instead of asking what the engineers and the technologists are doing, what does science have to say about this? Okay? There's some interesting paths into this maze. I can only describe one. I'm just going to tell you the path into the maze that I'm interested in. At Near the end of this talk, I will sort of tell you I will tell you how I think this, what this path is and the way it fits in. But let me just sort of tell you a little bit about the path into the maze that I find is interesting. Basically, I'm going to try and tell you a little bit about the science of linguistics. I mean, if you're really talking about the science of linguistics, you'll say, well, there are many, many levels. There is the level of sound, the level of word structure, the level of syntax or sentence structure, the level of meaning, and the level of use. Fine. I'm really interested in meaning. I mean, sound is fine, and you know, peaches and speeches, that's all great. Word structure is fine. But actually, where I'm really interested in this thing, this part here, about semantics, the study of meaning, and pragmatics, the study of use, and I'm politely going to start this by talking about Noam Chomsky, since I've mentioned him once, and talking about anything in language without mentioning Noam Chomsky these days is a little difficult. Okay, but let's just do this. Noam Chomsky, well, he's a famous political activist. He's famous in all sorts of ways. He's best known, however, for his work on syntax, which, so to speak, is the grammatical structure of sentences. What combinations of words make good sentences and what combinations of words just don't work. And this is a thinker who's been deeply, deeply influential, and it's hard to summarize him up in a two words or in a very, very brief space of time. But if you had to really try to get to grips with what's important in Chomsky, I would say that the most important theme in Chomsky is the tension between two opposites. Okay? The first thing, he loves to emphasize the infinity of language, its open-ended nature. And on the other hand, he loves to emphasize how paradoxically easy it is for us to acquire. Let's have a quick look at this. Language is infinite? What? Well, Chomsky's got some pretty good arguments that it is. He's just sort of saying, well, look what we can do in most languages. And something like this will be the same in Danish as it is in English. I can talk about this is the house that Jack built. Or this is the mouse that lived in the house that Jack built. Or this is the cat that chased the mouse that lived in the house that Jack built. Or this is the elephant that sat on the cat that chased the mouse that lived in the house that Jack built. Or this is the atomic bomb carried on the back of the elephant that exploded all over... Da, da, da. I mean, I can start repeating words, but the point is I can build longer and longer sentences which are recognisable. Admittedly, they become a little bit cumbersome the longer they get. There isn't any obvious place to draw the line and say, no, 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 no. We don't go longer than this. We just don't do that. In some sense, language is infinite. 
And if you even look at the sheer combinatorics that are involved, the chances are that many of the sentences I've been saying tonight are sentences that have never been uttered before on the face of this planet, which is probably a good thing. But uh, the, the point is that you are interpreting them, you are understanding them, you are taking them in, because in some sense you're able to cope with this infinity. And that's the paradox. It's big, it's infinite, and yet we manage to do it. Part of the explanation is that language is what Chomsky would say is finitely generated. Okay, we've got these finite number of components and we mix them together in different ways like the house and the cat and so on. We mix them up. We do what computer scientists call recursion. And for Chomsky, the grammar is something that tells us about all these things fit together. But actually, what is really interesting with Chomsky is this move where he says that a grammar isn't just some kind of mathematical description of the way we put the things together. A grammar is something that lives in our heads. We have a language organ. And in fact, Chomsky has got this very ex interesting explanation for the very, very real fact that we do learn languages very easily. Or rather, <laughs> excuse me, I don't speak Danish yet. <laughs> and it is a struggle, okay. What I should really say is that children learn languages very well. Put them in the right environment, they will grow up bilingual, trilingual, they just soak up language the way a sponge soaks up water. Okay? And the answer, Chomsky's explanation for why this takes place is that, well, actually, we don't learn languages at all. Not our first languages. Basically, we've got it all up here. We've got the language order. We imagine the kid being born. Here's a child. We put him down in Denmark. Tick, 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 tick. A few parameters get set, a few sounds get picked up, but basically it's kind of like this list of choices. It could be like this or like this, this switch could be here or here, this switch could be here or here. Okay, tuck, 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 it's like that, and the next thing you know he's saying tuck and ordering pilsa, okay? <laughs> Take the same kid, drop him down in China, and yes, it's noodles and all that sort of thing, okay? It's just the way that you set the parameters. Now. That's an, interesting, that's an interesting account of language, and it's one that I'm going to try and raise some slight objections to at the end of the story. But although I wanted to talk about Chomsky and I wanted to mention this thing to sort of give, to, to enable me to sort of come up with a different picture towards the end of the talk, I do want to mention that there's one thing that makes for me Chomsky's work slightly less interesting than others' work. And that is one of the thing in Chomsky's work is that there is remarkably little about meaning. Chomsky is the person who introduced the world to syntactic structure in a real sense. He's got very little to say about semantics, very little to say about meaning. And in fact, for most of us, I think meaning is where the interest of language really, really starts. And I think it's also where the hard question starts. I mean, to come back to the start of the talk, Meaning? What can we say about it? Suppose I give you this text, and I'm sort of telling you, this is a text, learn it, understand it, okay? It's a text, it hangs together, it's not a bunch of sentences, this is what you have to do. Mia is a woman, she is very beautiful. She is a tree, she does not like men. Vincent is a man, she likes Vincent. Vincent owns a car, Vincent does not own any vehicles, Mia is not very beautiful. Now, the language is not particularly difficult, I think you will agree with that. You understand every individual sentence. But there is also some sense in which the whole, well, how can I put it, it's ridiculous. Okay, it tears itself apart, it's incoherent. It has a certain, how can I put it, strange, surrealistic beauty, perhaps, of a rather weak sort, but basically it's silly. And the point is that it's incoherent. It makes no logical sense. And this is where the first time you can talk about bringing logic into the picture. And as I said, I am a logician. The person who did this was actually a per an American logician and philosopher called Richard Montague, who did his work in the late 60s and early 1970s. And he's very blunt about his whole approach. 
Like in one of his most famous papers, he simply starts by saying, there is, in my opinion, no important theoretical difference between natural languages and the artificial languages of logicians. Nowadays, we'd say the artificial languages of the logicians or the computer scientists. Indeed, I consider it possible to comprehend the syntax and semantics of both kinds of language within a simple, within a single natural and mathematically precise theory. And on this point, I differ from a number of philosophers, but agree, I believe, with Chomsky and his associates, which is one of the few semi-polite things you will ever read Richard Montague saying about Chomsky, whose work he basically despised. Okay. What is logic? Ah, I don't know. I'm a logician, so I don't know. Roughly speaking, you could say it's the study of correct reasoning, of valid argumentation, of consistency and inconsistency, which is really just a sort of very abstract way of saying things like, well, these kind of patterns, all donkeys eat hay, Eeyore is a donkey, therefore Eeyore, Eeyore eats hay, that gets a tick. And all cars are vehicle, Vincent has a car, therefore Vincent has a vehicle, well that's good as well. But on the other hand, combinations like Mia does not like men, Mia likes Vincent, Vincent is a man, that's just incoherent. It's inconsistent, it pulls itself apart. That was logic the way Aristotle conceived it, but an interesting change took place in about 1870. Logic basically became mathematics. To use the phrase that Montague used in his thing, logic became these artificial languages. Now, it may seem strange that one would be interested in artificial languages, but even in the days before computers, the idea were clear. These were these languages that we understood completely, that in some sense were objective in the way we used them. They could be used to classify some things as good and some things are bad. Now, that's a very, very nice idea, but wait a moment. We don't use logics. How do we, how do we make the link with natural language? And this was Montague's contribution. He basically bluntly in his paper said, OK, I'm going to show you step by step how you translate natural languages into logic. OK, let me just put that again. It's not after Montague's work that you've got two different worlds, the worlds of logic and the world of language, and they live in separate, separate environments. And you can point to that and you say, that's kind of like this, and this sentence is kind of like this. It literally is like there is this logical universe over there that we understand a lot about. And Montague is saying, look, I can translate English or Danish or something into that world, and I can tell you a lot of stuff. OK, few limitations. He didn't show us how to translate everything. Okay. And you probably can't do everything in logic, but you can do a lot. And in fact, you could say that one great part of research in what's come to be called formal semantics has gone on, has gone on in the last 30 years trying to make Richard Montague's insight better. We want logics that, in a sense, are more human, and we want to know how to go from the text into these things we understand. Let's come back to that little elf. Do you remember the little elf who lived in the cottage by the sea? And I told you that the text was kind of magic. Well, not here in Christiania. I told you that the text was magic because it talked about talking elves and it talked about the sun talking and the moon talking. Actually, here's just one simple aspect of another way in which it's a magic text. It's got these things called pronouns in it. Sounds boring, but the thing is, here is a unit of meaning, a sentence. Here is a unit of meaning, a sentence. Here is a unit of meaning. We're stringing them together, and somehow, I'm not even sort of talking about the elf explicitly anymore, but somehow we're picking up all these she's all the way through to talk about that first little elf. How do we do this? How do we take this information? How do we make this connection? How do we bind these things together? Actually, even more interesting, look at this she and this her. This she ain't the elf. That's the moon. And you all knew it was the moon. Her is the elf. There's some other things that you did without even knowing you did it. You just read the story or understood when I did it. You actually linked all these words together. The elf lived in a cottage. And when it came down to the word dwelling, you linked the word dwelling with cottage. You knew I was talking about the same thing. What about that door? Which door was there the knocking at? 
Was it some strange door that I haven't mentioned somewhere? A door out at sea, perhaps? No. I bet you all thought it was the door in the elf's little cottage, didn't you? <laughs> now, how the hell did you do that? This is magic. And this is perhaps one phenomena out of, I don't know, 20, 30, 40, 500, 1,000 phenomena that make natural language work. Natural languages work. NAFRA, by the way, is really interesting. I mean, it's very revealing about our expectations. Like, the administrators denied the protest the permanent permit because they were violent. violent. And unfortunately, even in Christiania, we're probably saying that they is the protesters. Oh, dear. What terrible people we are. Change the sentence slightly, of course. The administrators denied the protesters a permit because they were afraid of violence. Oops. And suddenly they is becoming the administrators, okay? How did we do that trick? Go figure. Basically using some kind of logic, some kind of inference, drawing on our information, drawing on our expectations, and making it all hang together. That's how we're doing it. People like this, Hans Camp and, Han, Hans Camp and uh, Irena Heim, in the 1970s and early uh, in the 1980s and 1990s, really pinned down a lot of very interesting stuff. They created a field now which is known as dynamic semantics, in which you could sort of say they changed this view that texts, long sequences of texts, are like something that comes along and they change the state of the world. They change something, they make a new world, they change it again, they store the things that we're talking about, the things we find relevant and so on, okay? So that's what's called discourse representation theory, but in a sense, it's just another kind of logic, a more friendly kind of logic. They also, incidentally, and sorry, this is a kind of methodological thing, okay? I'm talking to you about a lot of stuff, and I've got the feeling that if I push too hard in giving you too many examples, I've got to sort of lose the thread of things. But there is a little methodological interjection I would like to make, and I'm not really quite sure how I could justify this. But I just said back then that Hans Camp and Irena Heim, in some sense, revealed what the logic of pronouns is, or more precisely, the logic of anaphora, the way we tie stuff together. Now, for me, what is really nice is when you're looking at this area of something, an area like this, you analyze it and it makes sense, and suddenly, it's like the light that you have shone down there reveals something weird in a bigger area. So you were trying to solve problem A, and you suddenly find that, my God, I was looking at that, but actually it tells me about something bigger. So very, very briefly, I'd just like to tell you about another thing in natural language called presupposition. Because what was interesting was their work, which was about pronouns and things like this, it told something about presupposition. John regrets that Marie is pregnant. Cool. Now, you don't know John, and you don't know Marie. You don't know anything, but there's one fact that you all have in your head now. And that's Marie is pregnant. What is kind of interesting is normally when you say something to somebody, and you say the opposite, it has completely different effects. But now consider this. John does not regret that Marie is pregnant. Sort of said the opposite, okay? And what you've all got in your head just the same is that, well, Marie, she's still pregnant, okay? This isn't the way logic normally works. If you go between the positive version of a sentence and the negative version of a sentence, different things are conveyed. These, this sentence conveys the same thing, okay? Presuppositions are everywhere in every language. Now, here's some. Butch knows that Z is dead. Butch does not know that Z is dead. It was Butch that answered the phone. It was not Butch that answered the phone. Butch wants another cocktail. Butch does not want another cocktail. Now, I don't care which version you look at, but you all figured out that. OK, that's what you all figured out. OK, Z's dead. <laughs> Z's dead, baby. Z's dead. OK? Someone answered the phone. And Butch has had at least one cocktail. Okay, he's here tonight with us in spirit, I'm sure. Okay. So, translation into logic. That's the answer. 
That's my final answer. What is the meaning of natural language? It's translation to logic. That's how we do meaning. Wow, oh, this, the, the temptation here is so rich. I'm a logician. And actually, a part of me wants to say yes. Okay? Part of me wants to say no, there's more and all this. But hell, I'm going to go for the yes answer just for the hell of it. Yeah, that's all there is to it. But we've got to be careful. For a start, I've been talking in a sense about semantics. When I got into the presupposition thing, I was more getting into interaction. It's pretty clear from those presupposition examples that when I say John regrets that Maria's pregnant, that in some sense I'm foregrounding certain information. I'm foregrounding the attitude of John about Maria's condition, and I just want you to accept Maria's pregnancy. It's an efficient way of getting information across. It's kind of like, yeah, just accept that bit. This is the other bit to think about. It helps keep this communication smooth and like that. But actually, this is only the tip of the iceberg because I said I was interested in meaning. Now, in one sense, semantics is the study of meaning, but it's really, in my opinion, only when you come to pragmatics, which is about how we use language, that you really, really, really start seeing the really interesting stuff about meaning. Why? Whoa because that's how you use language. And when you use language, you typically do it with another person. And using a language with another person, wow, that's when it gets wild. That's what language use really is about. And that's where logic rules. OK, now let me just sort of explain a little bit about this. Actually, I think I've pretty much said that. OK, let me move on here. Now, here's a simple example. Motorist, I'm out of gas. Pass a bike, there's a garage just around the corner. Now think about it. Yeah, I know, it's, it's obvious, you've got to... Now think about it. What the hell is going on there? Where does the word garage from? What is going on there? What is going on there is that you've got two agents with massive commands of very complicated languages, massive amounts of knowledge about the world, and this is how they're interacting very, very officially. I'm out of gas. Come on. We know what is being asked for here. We know what is needed. The reply here, there's a garage around the corner. Cut the crap. That's where you can get the gas. This, the way that we transmit information to each other, often by emitting huge, huge chunks and relying on the fact that the other person will be able to fill in the gaps. Now, let me just move on a bit. Here's another one. Now, here's a reference letter. Now, imagine that this is a reference letter written by somebody who has applied for a job at the Niels Bohr Institute as the head theoretical physicist. And here the reference letter comes back. Mr. Smith is neat and tidy. He has good penmanship skills. His spelling seems unproblematic, and he is capable of, and he's, he appears capable of engaging in normal conversations without undue difficulties. What does that letter mean? It probably means Mr. Smith is going to read this letter. I can't be rude. Under no circumstances, let him within five kilometers of the Niels Bohr Institute. That's what this letter means. Okay? To put it another way, we've got these shared kinds of knowledge. And because we can draw on them, we can build on them positively, but also, so to speak, we can exploit the fact that other people know this to come across with completely different messages. Now, I'm going to introduce one last technical concept because it's a very beautiful one, the concept of common knowledge. And when I first tell it to you, it's probably going to seem like a really silly idea. Common knowledge is kind of like the knowledge we all have in common. Yeah, that's pretty boring, isn't it? Yeah. I'm thinking about things like money. We've all got this common knowledge that money works. I mean, probably if I point at one of you at random, you probably deep down believe that when you pull that paper out of your pocket and go to the bar, they're going to give you a cocktail. Now, why should they do that? It's just paper, isn't it? No, we've got common knowledge about the way these things work. We know what it is. It's absolutely rock solid what money is, and it depends on the system of mutual knowledge. Let me just give you a little puzzle to explain to you that there is this thing called common knowledge, and it's something to do with reasoning about other people's knowledge, 
and that there is actually a logic of this stuff which is interesting. I'm going to tell you a story about three clever girls. Three sisters are playing. Two of them get mud on their foreheads. None of the children can see their own forehead, but they can see each other's. Hey, so they all know that at least one person has mud on their forehead. Okay? I've, actually, this picture is not a good picture in a way, since I'm really imagining a tiny little smudge, not this glorious sort of mud everywhere. But, you know, three little girls, and they're all nicely dressed, but, you know, two of them have got this sort of spot of mud, and one of them's got a clean forehead. That's the important thing. Now, here is where the story gets weird. Along comes their father. He tells them what they already know, because they've seen each other. At least one of you has mud on your forehead. So the father comes along and tells them what they already know. Okay? And then he says, do any of you know if you've got mud on your own forehead? And unsurprisingly, there's a silence. After all, how the hell are you going to know if you've got mud on your own forehead? You can't, you know, no mirrors, by the way. Okay, I should have said that, no mirrors. And then he says a second time, do any of you know whether you've got mud on your forehead? And the two girls with the mud on their forehead, I said they were clever girls, their hands are up so fast and they're both right. How did that happen? Does anybody see how that happened? You've got to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. Those little girls are sitting there and suddenly they all know that everybody's aware of the mud situation. And the father asked the first time, of course, you don't know. But then the father asks a second time, and you're one of the little girls, and let's say you've got mud on your forehead. And you're looking at your other sister who's got mud on her forehead, and you're sort of saying, wait a minute. Why didn't she stick her hand up, you know, okay? No mud on that forehead, so she can say, oh, she's seeing mud somewhere else on me. In other words, reasoning about other people's knowledge and knowledge of knowledge and other things. By the way, what the father did was vitally, vitally important. It's true that each girl individually knew that there was mud, that, you know, at least one, that each girl knew individually that at least one other person had mud on their forehead. But when the father made that public announcement, you created that common knowledge. It was there on the table. We all know this. And this legitimates reasoning about what other people think about. This is the same sort of beliefs in a sense that make money work. Okay, I think probably a few economic steps have been skipped in that little explanation of the economic and monetary systems, but if we can kind of just gloss over these without sort of, you know, sweep the details under the table, I think we'll be happy here. Okay, so there is a logic of common knowledge. To put it another way, to try and sum it up, I think there is a power of words, and I think logic has something to do with it. Not all of it, I can see that, but something. And it's an interesting research proposal. And to finish, I would like to come back with a slight anti-Chomskyan argument. I just want to sort of briefly sort of say something about the notion of gender roles. Chomsky argues that it's difficult to explain how children acquire language except via innateness, the fact that they've got it. The speed and seeming inevitability of language acquisition gives this hypothesis some plausibility. Okay? Now, arguably, I would say, Acquiring understanding of gender roles is something that is as swift and as complex and just as hard to avoid. As I said, drop a kid in a linguistic environment, he comes out speaking Danish or Maori or Tagalog or Chinese. It's very, very hard to stop children acquiring the gender roles that they see about them. Again, it's kind of got that water into a sponge feeling. In fact, this is a very, very nice introduction to the book Delusions of Gender. There's a very famous case of a Canadian couple, Sandra and Daryl Ben. They decided to raise their children, Jeremy and Emily, in a gender-neutral way. And these guys were serious about it. I mean, they were serious. They edited books. I mean, you know, this, this was so serious. Now, I don't want to sort of go into whether it was right or whether it was wrong or the outcome of that story. Okay. That doesn't really bother... That doesn't really... It doesn't really bother me what the particular outcome was. My point is that there seems to be something analogous going on here. We've got two things that are very, very easily learnt, 
And what I think is clearly the case in the gender thing, since I think gender very clearly is something that's pretty much largely socially constructed, we can debate that, is that somehow our social logic, living up to others' expectations, learning what other people's expectation, is something that goes into our minds very, very fast. I think this is at least as interesting in the explanation of language acquisition, which, funnily enough, almost has the same kind of recursive mathematical structure as Chomsky's own explanation involving grammars and innateness. To put it another way, there was this long debate. Is Chomsky right? Is Chomsky wrong? Is there really a specialized language acquisition device? Or are there more general cognitive mechanisms which enable us to learn stuff? And I would say that something like the logic of common knowledge, or to put it more richly, the logic of society, the logic about how other people work, I would say that's a reasonably interesting candidate for thinking about these things. That's pretty much the end of my talk. I should really just sort of say that um, you heard me talking about language. I come from one particular research tradition. I come from a research tradition that emphasizes the importance of computation, linguistics, logic, and things like that. It's an interesting research tradition, but it's not the only one. Different speakers would have given you different things. Is what I've been talking about to you, to, to what I've been talking to you tonight, science? Maybe the best definition of science is that science is the way Thomas Kuhn defined it. Science is when some kind of study achieves a state of doing normal science, which for Kuhn means that there is some paradigm, some fixed way of doing things, some pattern that people can follow in the way they carry out their explorations. I would love to say that the field that I'm in really is scientific in the full Kuhnian sense, but I have to admit that you know, humility and just honesty makes me admit that probably it ain't there yet, that we kind of got a whole lot of little paradigms or baby paradigms or paradigmlets that kind of cover some of the stuff that you find in language and, you know, but let's keep going. But instead of wondering too much about this, I'd just like to put up pictures of some of the people you met, some of the people have been telling you about what language is from this perspective, whose names came up in the course of this talk, or at least some of them, and I think my time is up, so thank you very much. Um, we have time for some questions, so... Yeah, um, thank you for a very interesting talk, Patrick. Um, I thought about what you said about um, pragmatics, that pragmatics is um, dealing with the use of language. And, um, and it was interesting to focus on what is what we leave uh, unsaid. Um, and, so, and you also said that language is ambiguous in its uh, nature. So I thought about, um, maybe you have already answered it in your talk, but do you think that we can ever uh, mathematize language fully? Or do you not agree that language can never be fully reducible to mathematical logic? And I think about um, Nietzsche, who says that um, music shows us the inner core of the world. I think, um I think there's a lot of presuppositions built into that question. Like, um, for a start, I would say it's a really good analogy between mathematics and music. Um, we do know a lot about harmony and about all sorts of things. So in some sense, music can be theoreticalized and it can teach us an awful lot. We don't expect that that sort of theoretical explanation replaces the experience of hearing music, but it certainly can enhance it for some people. Okay, I think it's probably the same thing for the mathematization of language. Uh, for a start, I mean, I know there's a lot of physicists in the audience. It's certainly the case that it's possible, say, to write down wonderful equations that in some sense capture the whole beauty of the universe. We used to think that Newton's equation and his use of the calculus captured the way vast parts of the universe worked. Now we know that that was wrong. But the point was, in one sense, those equations told us everything. 
But yet, in another sense, they told us so little, since we know that to use those sort of things, you have to go away and look at the world and see, what do these equations mean here? What are they telling me here? That mathematization is a tool for exploration. There's a presupposition, I think, in your question that a mathematization of something is kind of like, that's it. We've killed it. We've nailed this carcass to the wall and it ain't never going to move again. Thank God it's dead. It's not like that. A mathematization of something is more like a tool. It's more like the sculpture's knife that you're able to wield to reveal important new patterns. So, I don't know. To be honest, no, I, I don't really expect that everything's going to be mathematized about language because... Mathematics, logic is just one tool. There's lots of other interesting ones. I, I don't know. But on the other hand, the presupposition that even if it could be done, that this in some sense perhaps would kill something or lose, you quote Nietzsche, lose in a sense the sort of uh, flavor of something. I, 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 don't, I don't agree with that. Was that an answer? <laughs> okay, sorry. Yeah, there was a question here. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if you could elaborate a bit about that part of the biological, thing, the Chomsky, the biological thing about the language. And I'm thinking because I speak more than two or three languages, and I've had some like experience, probably more people experience this, that you kind of feel sometimes when you learn these languages, like a physical reaction, you can kind of feel it when you change between them because it's so hard. I don't know if that's any, I mean, it's kind of two uh, things. I, I'm not sure I can, can I just ask you a question though? Are you bilingual or trilingual? Or did you learn these five. languages later in life? Yeah, I've learned two languages within the last couple of four or five years. And, and switching between those languages, kind of, it's like a road in your head. You have to change the track. Yeah, I agree. Chomps, uh, at least in, until fairly recently, there used to be a big distinction in the linguistic literature between I'm going to put it genuine bilingualism and trilingualism and the way that they handle languages and what happens to later language learners, which, yes, there is often something very, very painful about this. Um, so in some sense, there is, this there is this sort of theory that there is the language acquisition device and that if, if it is emerged in the appropriate thing, the parameters will be correctly set. It doesn't really matter how many languages. And I think there's probably pretty much a feeling that given there's adequate exposure to all the languages, you've got them all, and after a certain amount of time, you'll be able to go with them easily. It's only for later stages when the language acquisition device, so to speak, has frozen over that you would experience these sort of difficulties. Or at least that would be something like the Chomsky position. Okay, so how can I put it? It's okay for kids. Adults are going to have difficulties, very, very crudely speaking. Uh, okay. Yeah. Question here. Um, yeah, well, first of all, you're really, really good. Um, but <laughs> my question is, do you think that computers will ever be able to create and understand language as beautiful and original as the part from Macbeth, for example? Um, I think probably yes, actually, because... Um, I think if you sort of add enough time and enough complexity and the fact that if few computers ever got to the stage where they're able to build themselves and evolve and all this sort of thing, God knows what could happen. But yeah, why not? I, uh, to put, let me turn the language on your head. I would say the answer is yes, because they already did, because that's kind of what we are. I mean, unless you're going to sort of say that, evoke a religious explanation or something like that, if you sort of accept the sort of view the standard scientific view sometimes like there was a bunch of chemicals, they got zapped, along came the amino acids, along came the DNA, and so on and so forth. Unless somewhere along the way you're going to add something extra to the mix, something like spirit or something like that, it's hard to see what else there could be. Okay, I mean, admittedly, this is an argument from ignorance, but I would actually, but what I'm trying to say is I think it's already happened and there's a room full of us here, okay? And it may have happened on other planets. Um, it could happen with the things we build ourselves. Why not? I mean, I, I really don't see a good answer that says, no, it can't happen. Cool. OK. OK. Any last question? Yeah. Sir, one from here. Is language arbitrary? <laughs> uh, not usually. I mean, I was pretty careful what I said tonight. 
I have one question. Sure. Um, so speaking, I know that you're a logician, and I'm maybe stepping into psychiatry. But um, so some people argue that depending on which language you speak, it will influence the way you think. And if we put ourselves into the position of a computer, would we be able to have an influence to the way a c computer thinks? That sounds far out somehow. Do, do you follow me? That if you're speaking about I as a human being, yeah. I can be influenced by language and by culture, and therefore I think in a certain way. A computer thinks with algorithms and at some point stops, but it doesn't return anything um, as an opinion or something like that. You know. <laughs> no, I agree with you totally. Um, but the point is, uh, there's two answers to that. When algorithms get sufficiently complicated and sufficiently probabilistic, okay, I think they give rise to very, very rich behavior. Okay, you say that computers work according to algorithms, and implicit in that was kind of like the stating that I'm a human being and I don't. Whereas one obvious reply there is that, well, given some sufficiently rich notion of algorithm, something like that must be in, at work in us. These are rich algorithms that we acquire when we're growing up, we acquire in society, and we acquire working with other people. But these are very, very rich social algorithms. and they evolved, okay, that's one answer. And the second answer is that when I said, that was an answer to this question, that ultimately I could, I don't have a principled answer that says, no, language use is not possible in a computer, fine. I wasn't really thinking about anything like we've got at the moment. I mean, to be honest, there is a certain sense, I think, in which, um, I wouldn't want to say that in order to get a language using computer, you would, in a sense, kind of have to build us or to build an R2-D2. I mean, maybe it could be something very, very different, like, I don't know, something like something from Proxima Centauri or from another planet. But the point is that to use language in anything like the way that we use it, it would have to be something that interacted with this environment, something that interacted with us, something that interacted with animals, probably something with animals. My battery's run out, help me! Okay? So when you use the word algorithms, it's like you're thinking about very, very simple stuff that has to be kept simple, that always is going to be simple, and almost like this is a bar. Whereas thinking more richly in terms of interaction and all these sort of things, I think these open new possibilities. I mean, I just don't have a good reason for saying that these things are not possible. Um, I don't see a good argument. I've never come across a good argument. Um, I'm not really quite sure. I think I may have re-answered the old question, but I was trying to address your question. Actually, I don't know where you are, to be honest. Uh, I didn't... Oh, it's over there. I'm sorry. I was probably looking in the wrong direction. Uh, I'm very, very sorry about that. Um, was that an answer to the question, roughly, or plausibly? Okay, I think there's no more time for uh, questions here, but you're very welcome to approach Patrick at the bar. In uh, ask your, your questions here. So unfortunately, as uh, you heard, there will be no live act today, but we can promise you some really cool music. So please hang around and have some cocktails. And thank Patrick again for this very nice uh, lecture.